Hi, I'm Jade and I'm a medical student in Leicester. I'm doing an A to Z of dermatology, which is a whistle-stop tour of some important dermatological conditions to help you in your preparation for exams. In this third and last video of the series, we will fly through some conditions from P to Z. Let's begin. <laughs> P is for pityriasis versicolor. This is a superficial cutaneous yeast infection, commonly affecting healthy younger people, in particular those in hot, humid climates and those who perspire heavily. In pityriasis versicolor, well demarcated macules and patches of altered pigmentation are seen primarily on the trunk. This is associated with pruritus and some scales. People who are immunosuppressed or malnourished are at a higher risk of pityriasis versicolor. Topical antifungals are used as the first line treatment. Ketoconazole shampoo can be given for large areas. If the topical antifungals are not effective, then send scrapings off to confirm the diagnosis and consider starting oral antifungals like itraconazole. Patients should be given written and oral advice about the condition, including counselling that it can take several months for the skin colour to return to normal. Recurrence is also very common. Q is for questions to ask in a dermatological history. In a dermatological history, we follow the same format as any normal medical history. So presenting complaint, history of the presenting complaint, past medical history, surgical history, family history, drug history, allergies, social history and ice, that is, ideas, concerns and expectations. However, there are a few important questions that you would want to ask in a derm history that you may not ask in any other medical history. When asking about the presenting complaint and the history of the presenting complaint, ask about the initial appearance and the evolution of the lesion, if there are any other similar lesions or if there have been in the past. Ask about symptoms, particularly itch and pain, aggravating and relieving factors, previous and current treatments and whether or not they were effective, recent contact with anyone with similar symptoms, recent stressful events or illness. Also ask about history of sunburn, skin type and the use of tanning machines. Ask about the patient's past medical history and surgical history. You should also inquire specifically about atopy, dermatological conditions, previous cancers, immunosuppression like HIV or cancer, autoimmune conditions and hormonal diseases like PCOS. In the family history, you especially want to know about any skin cancers, skin conditions and or autoimmune conditions. In the drug history, you should ask if the patient has had any recent changes in medications and topical treatments used in the past or currently. The social history should allow you to determine the patient's occupation, whether or not they smoke or drink alcohol and if so, how much, recent travel, whether or not they use sunbeds, and importantly, whether their symptoms improve when they're away from work. Last but not least, ask about the impact of the condition on the patient's quality of life, as well as their ideas, concerns and expectations. R is for rosacea. Rosacea is a chronic relapsing inflammatory skin condition characterised by recurrent episodes of facial flushing in the initial stages, later associated with persistent erythema, telangiectasia, papules and pustules. In severe cases, the nose develops a large bulky shape and is known as rhinophyma. Rosacea is caused by an increased reactivity of the capillaries to heat, causing flushing and eventually the telangiectasia. Sebaceous glands are prominent, yet unlike acne, the skin is dry and not greasy and there are no comedones. The nose, cheeks and forehead tend to be commonly affected. The first step of management is reassurance, education and advice. Reassure patients that although rosacea cannot be cured, it's a benign condition. There are very, very few rare complications and symptoms can be controlled. Advise the patient to avoid triggers that can cause flushing. Common triggers include alcohol, spicy foods, hot drinks and aerobic exercise like running. If facial flushing is a predominant feature, then consider prescribing brimonidine, which is an alpha adrenoceptor agonist. They must also use daily sunscreen. Mild to moderate rosacea should be treated with topical metronidazole or topical azelaic acid. Moderate to severe papulopustular rosacea usually requires oral antibiotics like oxytetracycline. S is for solar keratosis, 
which is also known as actinic keratosis. Actinic keratosis is a premalignant skin condition. There is a small risk of lesions transforming into squamous cell carcinomas, although most individual actinic keratoses resolve spontaneously. On examination, actinic keratosis looks like a small, red or pink, or skin-coloured, crusty lesion and is found on sun-exposed areas like the scalp, face, shoulders and neck. Most individual actinic keratoses can be managed in primary care, although referral is necessary if there are any signs of SEC, like bleeding, ulceration or nodularity. Patients must be advised to reduce further risk of sun damage by using sunblock, also advise patients to use sunglasses, wear hats, cover skin up with clothing and avoid going outdoors in the midday sun. Fluorouracil cream can be prescribed for three to four weeks for small areas of damage. This topical treatment can cause the skin to become red and irritated in the short term. Topical diclofenac creams can also be used. There are less side effects than Effidix, but it's not as effective and must be used for longer periods of time, usually about 12 weeks. Finally, consider topical imiquimod, photodynamic therapy, cryotherapy or curatage. T is for tinea infection, which is also referred to as dermatophytosis. Dermatophytes are a group of fungi that invade and grow in dead keratin. Tinea infections can occur anywhere on the skin. Tinea capitis is where there is tinea infection of the scalp. It's most commonly seen in children, and on examination you'll see an area of alopecia and scaling with signs of inflammation like erythema plus pustules as well. If left untreated, a raised, pustular, spongy mass called a carrion can develop. It's hard to diagnose clinically, so scalp shavings should be sent off for microscopy and culture to confirm the diagnosis. Once confirmed, tinea capitis is treated with oral antifungals and topical ketoconazole shampoo. Tinea corporis, or ringworm, is a fungal skin infection that usually affects the trunk, legs or arms. On examination, you'll see a well-defined annular erythematous lesion, or lesions, with pustules and papules associated with a raised scaly border. Patients usually complain of pruritus. Ringworm may be treated with topical antifungals or oral fluconazole. Tinea pedis is the term used when there is fungal infection of the feet. It's also known as athlete's foot. It is characterized by pruritic, scaling and fissuring skin between the toes, which spreads to the sole and dorsal aspect of the foot. Topical antifungals are used as management, although oral antifungals can be given as second-line treatment. U is for urticaria. The typical lesion, called a wheel, is a central itchy white papule or plaque that is raised due to swelling of the epidermis of the skin. This is surrounded by erythema. Urticaria occurs due to the activation of mast cells in the skin, resulting in the release of histamine and other inflammatory mediators. This causes leakage of fluid from the capillaries, causing localized edema and vasodilation, which results in the erythematous flare. Triggers may include foods, insect bites, stings, viral infections, medications, hot or cold temperatures, and contacts with allergens like latex or chemicals. Where possible, the trigger must be identified and avoided. Non-specific aggravating factors should be eliminated as well, like overheating, stress, alcohol, and caffeine. Topical agents such as calamine lotion or topical menthol 1% in aqueous cream may also help to ease pruritic symptoms. Non-sedating antihistamines can also be given, like cetirizine, loratadine, and fexofenadine. Urticaria can sometimes be confused with angioedema by medical students, but they're very, very different. Urticaria is a swelling of the epidermis and dermis, while angioedema is a swelling of the subcutaneous tissues and submucosal tissues. Urticaria is less severe and usually affects the skin only, while angioedema affects both the skin and mucosal surfaces like lips and around the eyes. And lastly, urticaria is also very itchy, whereas angioedema is not commonly associated with pruritus, rather it's associated with pain and tenderness. V is for venous ulceration. Firstly, what is an ulcer? An ulcer is defined as a loss of the epidermis and the dermis. A venous ulcer is shallow and has a granulated base. It's commonly seen in the gaiter region, which is the area of the lower limb between the mid-calf and the ankle. 
It's associated with pain, especially at the end of the day, and symptoms of chronic venous insufficiency, like aching, pruritus, and a bursting sensation. Can you think of some other signs of venous insufficiency that may be present? Other signs of venous insufficiency include varicose eczema, thrombophlebitis, hemosiderin skin staining, lipodermatosclerosis, and atrophy blanche. Other sorts of ulcers include neuropathic ulcers, which are painless ulcers found on pressure areas commonly seen in people with diabetes, and arterial ulcers, which have well-defined borders, a necrotic base, and a punched-out appearance. Some risk factors for developing venous ulcers are increasing age, pregnancy, obesity, and history of pre-existing venous incompetence or venous thromboembolism. Underlying venous insufficiency should be confirmed by duplex ultrasound. If infection is suspected, for example if the ulcer is erythematous or purulent exudate is present, then consider swabs for microbiology. Consider a thrombophilia and vasculitic screening in young patients, especially if there's a suspicion or family history of prothrombotic and autoimmune diseases. An ankle brachial pressure index, or ABPI, is important in non-healing ulcers to assess for poor arterial flow, which could impair healing, and to determine if compression therapy is suitable. Conservative management includes leg elevation, increased exercise, weight reduction and improved nutrition if appropriate. Compression bandaging, usually four layer, can aid venous return and improve healing. And dressings and emollients must also be given for surrounding skin. W is for warts. Anogenital warts are benign growths of the epithelium caused by infection with the human papillomavirus. HPV is transmitted sexually in most cases. Risk factors include smoking, early age of onset of sexual intercourse, history of other STIs, and immunosuppression. The lesions are typically painless and they may cause itching, bleeding, or dyspareunia. Condom advice is advised until the lesions have resolved. As it is very common for patients with genital warts to have concurrent STIs, screening should be offered for chlamydia, gonorrhea, HIV, syphilis, and hepatitis B and C. As smoking is a risk factor, smoking cessation should be encouraged. Psychological distress is common, so referral for counselling may be appropriate. One third of warts regress spontaneously within six months, so it may be appropriate to not offer treatment if the patient is willing. Topical imiquimod can be used to shrink the warts. Cryotherapy, excision, electrocautery or laser can be used, although recurrence rate is very high. X is for xanthelasma. Xanthelasma are benign yellow flat plaques that occur on the upper or lower eyelids. They represent areas of lipid-containing macrophages. In other areas of the body, the individual lesion would be called a xanthoma. Xanthelasma is the most common xanthoma. Besides xanthelasma and xanthomas, can you think of another clinical examination sign of hypercholesterolemia? Yep, corneal arcus. The most important investigation is fasting serum lipid levels. Also carry out a CV risk assessment, as high lipid levels put patients at risk of cardiovascular disease, like strokes and MIs. There is no benefit in doing anything to the lesion. The most important management is reducing lipid levels through improving diet and increasing exercise. However, some treatment options are available, like surgical excision, laser treatment and cryocautery, although there is the risk of recurrence. Why? Thanks for watching.